Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you so much, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes? yes? OK. Uh, today, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts on oxidative stress and carbohydrate intolerance. In particular, I'd like to share with you some ideas that uh, are out there in the literature, but maybe are not really fresh in people's minds when they think about these things, especially the idea that oxidative stress is an important component of cellular signaling and that uh, it communicates uh, energy overload when cells are overloaded with more energy than they can tolerate uh, and thereby sends a proper signal to decrease energy uptake into the cell. And one form that that can take because glucose is an important energy molecule is decreased retention of glucose in the cell, uh, which could take the form of decreased glucose uptake or, de de or uh, increased glucose output. And that can in turn lead to uh, elevated blood sugar, glucose intolerance, and uh, thus uh, carbohydrate intolerance. And I'll also share with you some ideas that would suggest that oxidative stress can also be a form of miscommunication sometimes. And when I get into that, I'll share with you some of the findings briefly of part of my doctoral research. Uh, but before I get into all of that, I would just like to briefly kind of set the framework that we're dealing with by addressing the question of whether humans uh, are adapted to consuming carbohydrate, mainly because uh, this is what kind of renders the rest of my talk meaningful. In other words, if humans are not adapted to consuming carbohydrate at all, then it wouldn't be very meaningful to ask the question, what causes glucose intolerance? Because the answer would just be that humans don't tolerate glucose. Uh, so uh, clearly, it would take me much more than a 40-minute talk to comprehensively address this question, and that's not my intention. I would just like to offer a couple very brief illustrative examples of why I'm working uh, for, uh, on these questions from the starting point of assuming that humans should be able to tolerate consuming carbohydrate in the absence of particular pathologies. One of the most interesting cases of a carbohydrate-specific adaptation that humans have is uh, the duplications in the gene for salivary amylase. And salivary amylase is an enzyme in our saliva that digests starch into sugar. And basically, when we first eat a bite of starch, immediately the salivary amylase starts turning some of that starch into sugar. So this, uh, as far as we know, this enzyme is specific to starch. So duplications of that, of that gene for that enzyme are an adaptation that is specific to starch, which is a carbohydrate, and is thus this is a carbohydrate-specific adaptation. On the left, we can see the number of copies of this gene in 15 wild-caught West African common chimpanzees. And uh, each bar represents a chimpanzee, an individual one. And the height of the bar indicates the number of copies they have. And as you can see, they all have two copies, one from their mother and one from the father, indicating that in this sample of chimpanzees, there aren't any duplications of the gene for salivary amylase. On the right, we see a totally different picture in the case of humans. And we see this from eight different human populations across the globe, which are broken down into low starch eaters and high starch eaters. The high starch eaters are Japanese, European Americans, and Hadza, who consume uh, starches as a major portion of their carbohydrate. And the others are either hunter-gatherers or pastoralists who eat uh, mainly meat or fish. And their carbohydrates come from things like milk, fruit, uh, and honey, things that don't have any starch. And what we see, uh, this graph is organized differently than the one on the left. As we go up across to the right, we see increasing numbers of duplications for the salivary amylase gene. And as, the higher the bar is, this indicates that the, more, uh, the higher proportion of people who have that number of copies, the red bars are the low starch eaters, and, or the no starch eaters, actually, in some cases, and the gray bars are the high starch eaters. And what we can see is that, unlike chimpanzees, uh, hardly anyone has only two copies of the salivary amylase gene, indicating that well over 95% of humans that have been sampled have at least one duplication in the salivary amylase gene. Not only that, uh, but we can basically get two things from this graph. One of them is that uh, if we look 
uh, if we imagine the gray bars as a curve, we can see that it's shifted slightly towards the right compared to the red bars, such that uh, people who do not, from populations that don't eat starch, have uh, uh, the, uh, on average, or not on average, but the, the uh, highest proportion of people in that pop those populations has four or five copies of the gene. And uh, for high starch eaters, uh, the highest proportions of people have six, seven, or eight copies. So we can see on the one hand, we can take questions at the end, on the one hand, there seems to be some natural selection promoting uh, more copies of this gene among people who traditionally have eaten starch. On the other hand, uh, it seems like almost everyone has this starch-specific adaptation, regardless of whether they come from a, a population that traditionally eats starch. Uh, these investigators suggested that these duplications may have begun around 200,000 years ago towards the beginning of modern humans. They didn't really have really strong evidence about that, so we're not going to put a lot of confidence in, in that dating, but what we can say is that most people alive seem to have these very specific starch-specific uh, starch adaptations that separate them from chimpanzees. And if we look at salivary amylase among great apes, uh, we see a very similar pattern. So this graph shows not the gene duplications, but the activity of the enzyme in the saliva. And we can see that humans, shown over on the left, have far greater salivary amylase activity compared to any of the other uh, great apes that have been measured here, gor gorillas, orangutans, uh, bonobos, and chimpanzees. Now, the question arises, what does this do? What does it matter, and why do we care? Why would this adaptation be useful? And here is a study that came out in the Journal of Nutrition just this past year that shed some light on it. And what, what they did was they gave people, uh, they tested salivary amylase activity in 48 people, and then they took the highest seven and called them the high amylase group, and they took the lowest seven, they called them the low amylase group, and then they got rid of everyone else so that they could see a nice, clear difference between uh, the high and low activity. So we can try to see what does this enzyme do. And uh, what, they, what they did was they took these people and they gave them, uh, it was sort of like a glucose tolerance test, but it was starch instead. So they gave them a solution of 50 grams of starch, they drink it over 20 minutes, and then they measure their plasma glucose. And so someone who, uh, who is well adapted to eating the starch should not have a very large rise in plasma glucose because they should be, uh, the glucose should be entering their blood and they should be using it at the same time and there shouldn't be too much disturbance in blood sugar. So what we see over here is that for people with low salivary amylase activity, the glucose response is much higher than for people with high salivase, uh, salivary amylase activity. So what's the, what this shows is that people with high salivary amylase activity are able to tolerate eating starch without disturbances in their blood sugar. The graph on the right shows a possible explanation of why. Here we can separate, uh, this is the insulin curve, and we can separate between the pre-absorptive, uh, which is in the first 10 minutes. If you look over here, it's 10 minutes before glucose really starts rising. So this early rise in insulin is uh, the rise in insulin that occurs once you eat the material, but before the sugar actually starts entering your blood. And then after that is the post-absorptive phase. And so what we can see is, uh, it's a small difference, but the pre-absorptive insulin release was higher with people who had high salivary amylase activity, and the post-absorptive insulin release tended to be lower. And what this seems to indicate is that uh, if you start breaking down starch in your mouth into some sugar, then the sugar alerts your body that there's carbohydrate coming in. Then your body knows and expects a carbohydrate, so it responds to it adequately. And this picture seems to indicate uh, sort of the con concept that if you, it takes a little, spending a little money to make a little money. In other words, if you can spend a little extra insulin in these first 10 minutes, then you can save a lot of insulin over here, right? So we start to get the idea that the salivary amylase gene duplications that seem to be characteristic of humans and separate them from the great apes is something that adapts them to eating starch and allows them to respond with that early insulin release that prepares their body to handle that carbohydrate load. And that's supported by the graph on the left, which shows that the greater number of salivary amylase gene copies that people had, the greater their sal salivary amylase activity. And in fact, gene duplications explained 81% of the variation in amylase activity. And then over on the right, that 
that salivary amylase activity in turn uh, explains about half of the variation in that early insulin response. And then finally, uh, this uh, other part of the study offers some further support to this idea. So here, they, th this uh, starch on the right, the starch graph shows um, basically the area under the curve of what we already looked at. On the left, we see the response to glucose. So they did the same thing, but they gave them 50 grams of glucose instead of 50 grams of starch. And we can see that here, the gene duplications don't make any difference at all. Everyone has the same response to glucose. But people who do not have, uh, people who have low amylase activity in their saliva have, are le have less tolerance to starch than they do to glucose. Whereas the opposite seems to be true for people with high salivary amylase activity. So what this seems to indicate is that most humans have at least some uh, adaptation to starch uh, that allows basically humans maintain the tolerance to eating simple sugars from things like fruits, but uh, compared to other great apes, humans have an expanded, re expanded repertoire of carbohydrate because they can also tolerate starch better. That's the general picture that emerges here. Uh, now, if we look back at this original graph, we can basically get two things out of this. One, there's a lot of variation in the tolerance to starch, right? Look at all over here from two copies to 15. Some people are going to handle starch a lot better than other people. On the other hand, what we can also see is that almost everyone has some increased capacity to handle starch when you compare them to, say, great apes. So if we were to summarize these data, we could say that between people who come from populations that have traditionally eaten starch and people who don't, there's a bit of difference. But on the other hand, when you compare them to chimpanzees who don't have any du duplications in the amylase gene, uh, one of the things that really stands out is that humans as a whole have these carbo carbohydrate-specific adaptations. Now, there's one other thing uh, that, that I'd also like to point out, which is that traditional diets among humans that have uh, good health has varied very widely. So here, if we just narrow in on the Pacific Islands, we can see that among people very similar, eating very similar diets based on tubers and fruit and coconut and fish, but in different proportions, we can see that carbohydrate ranges from 34% to 50% to 69% among these different groups. And I'm sure many of you know that there are other groups that have even more extremes. So for example, some people have estimated that the Inuit hardly consume any carbohydrate. And other people have estimated that the Tukacenta consume over 90% carbohydrate. So there seems to be a lot of variation, but this indicates to me that humans can thrive on a wide variety of different diets. And those diets, it seems, should be, should be able to have some carbohydrate. Now, I don't think this evidence indicates anything about uh, how much car carbohydrate people need to consume, and doesn't really tell us anything definitively about who can tolerate carbohydrate and just how much starch people can eat, nothing like that. So I'm not trying to make a quantitative uh, point here. I'm just trying to make the point that it seems like humans should be able to tolerate eating some carbohydrate. But then we run into this problem, which is that many people in our society can't. Only 58%, I mean, that's the majority, right? But still, only 58% of our population does not have any kind of hyperglycemic disorder. On the other hand, 42%, that's approaching half, have some type of hyperglycemia, whether it be the 13% who have diabetes or the remainder of that who have prediabetes. And prediabetes can be either elevated blood glucose or it can be glucose intolerance. And in other words, maybe your fasting glucose is fine, but when you eat sugar, your blood sugar goes out of whack. And in fact, we can say that about 25% of Americans have some kind of disorder where when they eat carbohydrate, their blood sugar goes out of whack. So the question that I'm going to try to ask here is, why, if we have carbohydrate-specific adaptations, and if healthy populations consumed anywhere from almost no carbohydrate to almost all carbohydrate, why is it that in our population, where we come from one of these populations with higher salivary amylase activity, for example, where we come from you know, a tradition of brain eating and so on, why is it in our population that we seem to be so intolerant of carbohydrates? Now, there are a lot of aspects to this particular question. Why is glucose intolerance uh, so common? There are a lot of ways to approach that, and I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to give the answer here, but I'd like to try to give part of the answer. And my working framework for understanding part of the answer is that it comes down to energy imbalance. 
Uh, in a healthy human, energy input should be balanced with the capacity to burn or store energy. Now, this, I am not trying to say that this all comes down to people are eating too much. That's not what I'm saying at all. But uh, it could be that people are eating too much. That could be part of the problem. It could be that people don't have the capacity to burn energy. That could be part of the problem. And it could be that people don't have the capacity to store energy. That could be a problem, too. And in fact, there are some animal experiments that show that if you delete a gene that controls the extracellular structure of the adipose cells so that the adipose cells are able to expand further than they ordinarily would be, then you can give rodents the same uh, purified, refined, high-fat diets that usually make them fat. And they still get fat, but they don't have any metabolic dysfunction because you've increased the ability to store energy. So it's not about people are eating too much. It's about somehow the balance is being broken between what we're eating and our capacity to deal with it, no matter how we deal with it, whether we store it or burn it or whatever. So when this balance goes out of whack, then I'm going to maintain that there are communication signals that lead to insulin resistance, and that insulin resistance is an adaptation in a, not a healthy adaptation, but sort of uh, the best we can do given this situation adaptation to this uh, disequil disequilibrium between uh, energy input and energy storage and burning. And this uh, insulin resistance has this adaptive function because what it does is it decreases the energy input into the cell. In other words, each cell is going to say, uh, you know, I can only handle so much energy. If I can't handle that energy, I'm going to stop taking it in. And then what, is, what does it do? It sits in the blood instead. So blood glucose goes up, blood triglycerides go up. All these energy molecules accumulate in the blood. And I'm going to explain how oxidative stress may contribute to proper communication and may contribute to miscommunication in these signals. In order to understand this communication process, we need to understand how insulin normally functions. What is the communication function of insulin in the normal state? And what we can see here is that it acts on the liver, the adipose, and the muscle tissue to regulate their balance of energy incoming and outcoming with the blood. The liver is an important organ that takes up glucose from the blood, but it also is an important organ that makes glucose from amino acids called gluconeogenesis and sends it out into the blood. Insulin normally uh, increases glucose uptake and suppresses glucose release from the liver. And this leads to a net flow of glucose from the blood into the liver. Similarly, it also increases the uptake of glucose into adipose tissue and into muscle. And this also increases the flow of glucose from the blood to these tissues. However, insulin also does a couple other things. It increases the synthesis of fat from carbohydrate in the liver and increases the output of this fat or triglyceride from the liver into the blood. It also increases the uptake of these triglycerides into adipose tissue and suppresses the release of fat from adipose tissue. And so all of this tends to make triglycerides flow from the liver into the adipose tissue and through the blood and from glucose from the blood into all these other tissues. Now, what happens in insulin resistance? Well, it depends which pathway we're talking about. So for example, if you look at the pathways promoting glucose uptake from the blood into the tissues, insulin resistance causes a breakdown in all of those pathways. However, if we look at triglycerides, we, and the, excuse me, and this leads to an increase in plasma glucose. If we look at triglycerides, the situation is a little different. Insulin resistance interferes with the uptake of tri triglycerides into adipose tissue. However, during insulin resistance, as it occurs in humans, the pathway that causes triglycerides to come from the liver into the blood is maintained. Now, what this, what this does is it increases triglycerides in the blood because the triglycerides are coming out of the liver and they're not going into adipose tissue. But we can also see something really, really interesting about this pattern, and that is that it's selective. Insulin resistance doesn't target every pathway equally. So if you notice, this is the one pathway where it's promoting energy output from one of these organs, and that's the pathway that's maintained. The other pathways where insulin promotes energy intake into the organs, those all become resistant. So this is part of the reason why I believe that insulin resistance is an adaptation to energy overload, because when the liver is overloaded with energy, it, it moves from 
uh, from responding differently in, in triglycerides and glucose to basically trying to push all of that stuff out into the blood, regardless of whether it's triglycerides or glucose. So insulin resistance is basically stopping the retention of energy in cells that are already overloaded with energy. So how does oxidative stress fit into this? Well, first I have to define oxidative stress for you. The old definition is that you have to have a general balance between oxidants and antioxidants. And when that balance gets out of whack, then you get oxidative damage to uh, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids, and whatever else you have in the cell. Just every, everything starts getting destroyed. In 2006, Dean Jones from Emory University proposed that we redefine oxidative stress, and I'm very sympathetic towards his view. And I basically summarized it uh, here with my own graphical de depiction. This is that oxidants and antioxidants play an important role in cell signaling. And in fact, we don't just have a general balance, but we have numerous different compartments that all regulate a certain, uh, a certain coordinated set of proteins to regulate their function. And these proteins' functions are regulated by electron transfer uh, reactions, in other words, oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions. And when this gets out of balance, then we have disrupted communication that leads to improper protein function. And Jones isn't saying that oxidative damage doesn't occur, but what he's saying is instead that when we have these imbalances and we lead to an over, which leads to an overproduction of oxidants, that 90% of these oxidants are not free radicals, but there are other things like hydrogen peroxide, and about 10% are free radicals that can damage molecules. However, about 99% of those free radicals get converted into these other oxidants, and only a tenth of a percent of the original oxidants are left over to damage macromolecules, like proteins, lipids, and DNA, whereas 99.9% .9 are there to disrupt uh, cell signaling. That's what he's saying. Now, I would, take, uh, I would expand this and say that it's not always a disruption of cell signaling, but some of this is actually uh, proper communication of, the, of cell signaling to communicate that energy overload. So what I would say is that uh, we need to have energy intake and energy capacity in some sort of balance. And when that balance gets thrown off, this sends an imbalance, uh, that, it can, that imbalance is communicated into the balance of oxidants and antioxidants. And the, the reaction is for that communication signal to tell the cell to do what it needs to do to decrease energy uptake. So it's basically communicating that proper signal. And so this is important to understand because uh, basically if cells are overloaded with energy and they're producing signals that stop the influx of energy, that's not really a disruption of signaling, is it? I mean, basically you're just communicating what needs to be communicated. Shown here is an example of how this might work. So on the left, we see an experiment that isn't very realistic. It's a test tube experiment, but it demonstrates a certain principle. So what they did was they fed uh, rats a regular diet, a high-fat diet, or a high-fat diet plus a mitochondrial antioxidant. Uh, I refer to this as diet-induced obesity rather than a high-fat diet because there's lots of other things about these diets that are bad and induce obes obesity. So I would look at this as a uh, symptom of obesity or energy, whole body energy overload. What they did was they took the muscles from these rats and then they basically they inhibited the metabolism of energy and then they put in a lot of energy. Uh, so they're basically creating a maximal state of energy overload in the cells. And what you see is Hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidant, gets produced when you put in this energy input. And in the rats who are already suffering from obesity, that is high uh, whole body energy overload, the production of hydrogen peroxide is greater. Okay? Now this is an unrealistic scenario in that they've you know, really manipulated this experimentally, but, it's, but it's, we need to do this in order to demonstrate uh, the principle sometimes because we're dealing with really tiny uh, concentrations of oxidants that are often hard to measure. So this demonstrates an important point. What we see on the right is a more realistic set of results from the same animals where they gave the animals oral glucose tolerance test. And what we, can, what we see is that as expected, the uh, diet-induced obesity uh, increased plasma glucose response, in other words, it decreased glucose tolerance, and it increased the plasma insulin response. In other words, it uh, 
increased insulin resistance. Okay? But what's interesting here is the mitochondrial antioxidant, the same one that normalized hydrogen peroxide response to energy overload, uh, normalized the plasma glucose response and the plasma insulin response. So this indicates that hydrogen peroxide, an oxidant, may be carrying forth that signal that uh, saying to the, saying, the cell is saying, hey, I got too much energy, I'm not going to take in any more. So if you restore the oxidative capacity to the mitochondria and you get rid of that excess production of hydrogen peroxide, then all of a sudden you can tolerate the glucose and you are sensitive to insulin. So if we go back to this schematic that Dean Jones had published, I would modify it a little bit to adapt it to this scenario, that I'm, this picture that I'm trying to paint. So I would say, let's talk about energy overload as the main cause. Not that that's the, the cause of all oxidative stress, but that's what we're talking about here. Some of the free radical intermediates that are produced during energy overload are superoxide and the hydroxyl radical. Some of the non-radical oxidants are hydrogen peroxide. But in fact, what we're dealing with is a two-way street here. And so the mitochondrial will produce superoxide. Most of this will get turned into hydrogen peroxide. But it's not just that hydrogen peroxide only affects signaling. Hydrogen peroxide is really dangerous, right? If you have an infection, you pour hydrogen peroxide on it. What does it do to the bacteria? It kills them, right? Yeah, so hydrogen peroxide is dangerous, and that's in large part because of this two-way street, because hydrogen peroxide can then produce the hydroxyl radical, which can damage molecules. But most of this hydrogen peroxide is going to act in cell signaling to decrease energy retention, but I wouldn't really call that a disruption of cell signaling, because what does that do? That fixes this part over here. So all of a sudden, you know, we start with energy overload, but then we produce the hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide helps say, look, I'm overloaded with energy, and the cell uh, reacts to this by um, normalizing that process of energy overload. Of course, that has negative consequences, because if the cell says, hey, I don't want that glucose, what happens to glucose in the blood? It goes up, right? So, that's, so it's a problem, but, it's, it's, but you know, the alternative is for the cell to say, I'll take all the energy I want. I'll produce all the hydrogen peroxide I want. And then the cell finds itself in the same situation that that bacteria was in when you poured the hydrogen peroxide in the cut. Okay? So, it's, so uh, insulin resistance isn't a good thing, but there are, are alternatives which are worse, which are for the cells to have no regulation of how much energy they take in. And that can lead to a lot worse damage than insulin resistance itself leads to. So there are a couple questions that are left. And that, those questions are, uh, how does oxidative stress communicate energy overload? And this is, you know, there's a lot of work left to do, but I'll show some preliminary thoughts on this. And then, can it ever be a form of miscommunication? And I'll make the case that sometimes, it's, sometimes oxidative stress is a form of miscommunication, and there are things that we need to do to help regulate everything properly beyond simply fixing that energy balance. Uh, so one plausible hypothesis of how this might play out, this isn't definitive, but this is a general schematic, hydrogen peroxide and other oxidants may play a number of roles in cell signaling. One thing that they might do is oxidize and deplete glutathione, which is abbreviated throughout these slides as GSH. Glutathione is an antioxidant and detoxifier and regulator that we make from proteins. So when we eat protein, we make glutathione ourselves, and it has all kinds of functions, including as an antioxidant, but also as a regulator of protein function. One of the ways glutathione regulates proteins is by directly binding to them, so that in conditions of oxidative stress, glutathione will bind to the protein and change its function, and that will in turn allow the process of communication to go on. But another is that glutathione depletion will lead to the accumulation of methylglyoxal. And I'm going to share a little bit about this pathway with you, uh, first of all, because there's a little bit more known about it, and second of all, because I just did my dissertation on it, and, uh, and it saved me a lot of time to be able to prepare this talk if I could include some of that information here. <laughs> so, so hopefully you'll get something out of it, too. Okay, so methylglyoxal, which um, is abbreviated MGO through these slides, is shown in the upper left. And it reacts with amino acids to form advanced glycation end products, which are abbreviated here as AGEs. A lot of people blame advanced glycation end products on glucose, and the misnomer glycation really, really facilitates this, unfortunately. But in fact, most AGEs in the human body are not produced by glucose directly. They're produced by methylglyoxal and a couple other simil similar molecules. And here is the reaction of methylglyoxal with arginine, an amino acid that's found in proteins, to produce the most abundant 
advanced glycation end product found in human plasma and in animal tissue. And one of the things you can see here is that uh, the positive charge that's usually present on arginine is gone once the advanced glycation end product is formed. And if you change the charge of the amino acids in a protein, then all of a sudden you're going to change its shape. And if you alter a protein's shape, what do you think you alter? It's function, right? It's just like if, if you get in the house with your key and then you change the shape of the key, that key is not going to work anymore, right? But maybe it'll get into someone else's house, right? So it's not that you necessarily obliterate the function, but you change it, right? Now, when we alter protein structure and then alter protein function, most research on this focuses on chronic disease. And oftentimes it just skips right from here to here, totally uh, oblivious to the fact that when we alter protein structure and function, that allows a system of regulation. And most people don't talk about advanced glycation end products as regulatory molecules, but I think that, in fact, advanced glycation end products are regulatory molecules and are involved in, in communication. And here's a little scenario of how that might work. So methylglyoxal can primarily come from two sources. One is from glucose, not directly, but through the process of glycolysis. Glycolysis is, uh, uh, lysis is like to cut. Glycolysis is basically splitting glucose in half, and that's the first step in burning it for energy. And when we do that, we form some methylglyoxal in that process. The other place we get methylglyoxal is from acetone. Anyone know where acetone comes from? It's shown right up here, fatty acid metabolism, right? Acetone is, is produced during ketogenesis. So we break down fatty acids for energy, we produce some acetone, and acetone gets converted into methylglyoxal. Now there's two things that happen here. The first is when we produce methylglyoxal from glycolysis, methylglyoxal inhibits glycolysis. Now that's, I don't think that's an accident, I think that's a system of negative feedback. So that helps keep glycolysis in, in check. If you're breaking down too much glucose, you get more methylglyoxal, methylglyoxal comes back and stops that process just keeps it in check, right? Now, the other thing uh, that we see here is fatty acids, ordinarily, you know, if you read any textbook on biochemistry, they say you cannot make glucose out of fatty acids. And what that means is, when you break down a fatty acid into acetyl-CoA, and you go into the TCA cycle, theoretically, you should be able to get carbons that go through this pathway over to make glucose. But what happens is, Every time you bring in two carbons into the TCA cycle, two carbons leave as carbon dioxide. So you never get a net flow of carbons from fatty acids to glucose. However, if you convert fatty acids into acetone and into methylglyoxal, you can actually turn methylglyoxal into glucose. So when we shift into fatty acid metabolism, we do two things with methylglyoxal. One, we are we're not getting enough glucose because we're burning fatty acids instead, so we actually make some glucose from the methylglyoxal that we make from the fatty acids, but then it also comes and inhibits the breakdown of glucose, so we spare some glucose. So this indicates that methylglyoxal plays some legitimate communication functions and some legitimate uh, roles in metabolism. Okay? However, uh, there also is good evidence that methylglyoxal plays a role in disease. Here we see that methylglyoxal concentrations are elevated 3.6-fold in people with type 2 diabetes. Now, that indicates that either diabetes increases methylglyoxal levels or methylglyoxal levels increase the risk of diabetes, and we don't really know which one. And the data is not there to really tell us, but it might be a little bit of both. For example, if we look at the metabolic pathways regulating uh, methylglyoxal accumulation, we can see that insulin should be one of the primary, uh, pri primary protectors against the accumulation of methylglyoxal. Just to briefly go through it, methylglyoxal can be formed from acetone, as we said before, through this enzyme CYP2E1. It can be produced during glycolysis from these intermediates, triosphosphates. And when it's detoxified, it's detoxified using that master antioxidant of the cell, glutathione, abbreviated GSH. So where does insulin come in? Well, insulin decreases the production of acetone. Insulin decreases the activity of the enzymes that convert acetone to methylglyoxal. Insulin increases the activity of glycolytic enzymes that clear these intermediates that would otherwise accumulate and become methylglyoxal. Insulin increases the production of glutathione. Insulin increases the production of the first enzyme involved in the detoxification of methylglyoxal. All these indicate that insulin should be the primary protector against the accumulation of methylglyoxal and the formation of advanced glycation end products. 
And since diabetes is a deficiency of insulin, whether it's a deficiency of insulin itself in type 1 diabetes or a deficiency of insulin signaling as in type 2 diabetes, then that could be one reason why methylglyoxal is increased in diabetes. However, there's also good evidence that methylglyoxal may cause diabetes. So here, we injected, uh, or a group injected methylglyoxal into rats and it in, uh, increased the plasma glucose response to a glucose load uh, that can be seen most clearly over here. So it, in, it increased glucose intolerance. And here a scavenger of methylglyoxal attenuated this effect. Here we see that uh, infusion of rats with methylglyoxal concentrations over a month increases the apoptosis of pancreatic beta cells. In other words, half of the beta cells died in the pancreas which is a hallmark of severe type 2 diabetes. And this is seen with the brown stain on the right indicating dying cells. And this was consistent with other features of type 2 diabetes like insulin depletion in the pancreas and other things like that. So part of my dissertation project was to study whether glutathione being important for methylglyoxal detoxification actually means that we can change methylglyoxal concentrations by changing the levels of glutathione. If this is the case, then this would indicate that methylglyoxal could carry out signaling roles of glutathione depletion. Previous research has shown that uh, toxic chemicals like hydrogen peroxide or uh, other toxic chemicals that deplete glutathione all increase methylglyoxal concentrations in cells, but these were also toxic to the cells. And likewise, uh, the administration of BSO, which is an inhibitor of glutathione synthesis, increases uh, methylglyoxal concentrations in rats, uh, but this was given in the drinking water for a month, which proved also toxic to the animals, and that also caused their pancreatic beta cells to start dying and so on. So, uh, what, and this shouldn't be too surprising because when you administer this in the drinking water, you get an increase in oxidative damage. So what I wanted to look at was, is there a way that you can deplete glutathione and get this, uh, this increase in methylglyoxal that could communicate a signaling role of oxidative stress without having this damage in toxicity. Uh, so previous research had demonstrated that if you just do one injection of BSO instead of giving it in the drinking water, you get depletion of glutathione shown on the left, but no change in oxidative damage shown on the right. And so I took 48 rats and gave them either an injection of this BSO or control just once. And I showed that you could decrease glutathione and increase methylglyoxal but when we measured lipid peroxidation, it wasn't decreased. So I would conclude from this that BSO uh, depleted glutathione in my experiment by, uh, in the absence of cellular energy overload. Uh, and this could be seen as cellular miscommunication, right? Because we said before that when you get obese and you're, you have energy overload, then you start producing these oxidants that might de deplete glutathione, lead to increased methylglyoxal, and lead to insulin resistance. But here, these animals weren't fat. I just gave them a pharmacological drug that depleted glutathione, and that cause, causes the same effect, that downstream increase in methylglyoxal, which could cause insulin resistance and glucose intolerance. But uh, the, this pharmacological inhibition of glutathione depletes glutathione to similar levels that you could see from other things, like if you have a low-protein diet. So for example, in T. Colin Campbell's experiments where he fed rats low-protein diets, they had severely depleted glutathione, just like we would see with this pharma pharmacological inhibitor. And also, when rats undergo extended fasting for two days or more, they get similar depletions. And that's because you are deficient in the amino acids that you need to make the glutathione. So if you don't have what you need to regulate the system, then oxidative stress can be a form of miscommunication. And deficiencies in a lot of other nutrients, inflammation, toxins, all of these other things could theoretically cause miscommunication of the oxidative stress signal. So regulating glutathione is very uh, complex. It requires getting adequate protein. Undenatured whey proteins are uh, very important for cysteine in some cases. Uh, glycine from bone broths and other things, B vitamins, proper endocrine function, fruits and vegetables to supply polyphenols, and brought support for a lot of the other antioxidant defenses that can interact with glutathione. Uh, and so what I would conclude from this, and I have maybe 10 seconds left, is that um, we should be able to consume carbohydrate, and a lot of us can't. 
And I think part of this is because we have energy overload, but there might be a lot of other aspects of, to this that need a lot of other research. So for example, there might be a lot of other things like inflammation and toxins and nutrient deficiencies that lead to that oxidative stress signal without us being fat, and that can be a major problem too. And so basically what we need is a lot more research to try to define how we can regulate that proper communication, but I think a lot of what it comes down to is that traditional diet that's dense in nutrients and uh, gives robust thyroid and insulin and other endocrine function. So that's all I have to say, and thank you very much. Is that okay? She says it's okay if we take questions while the panelists come up. But I should warn people that I'm going to stay for the panel, so then any other questions will be have to deflected further. Oh, Chris. Hi. So I Hi. had a I had a quick uh, question. So are you suggesting, based on the amylase data, that there are maybe four possible categories for? humans adapting, so one group would be more tolerant to starches, one group would be more tolerant maybe to fruit, one group would be less tolerant to both of them, and one group would be more tolerant to both of them. Um, if you're just asking about the amylase adaptation, I think that indicates that compared to great apes, humans... I'm not saying yeah. for great apes, I'm saying yeah. within the bell curve of the human Within population. the bell curve, I think that indicates that some people can tolerate starch good, well, and some people can't tolerate, tar tolerate starch as well, but the amylase doesn't seem to have any implications for toleration of fruit. Okay. Um, however, okay. there could be other reasons that people can't tolerate fruit, like for example, maybe they have oxidative stress, or you could have digestive problems, lots of other things too. The other comment is that I've seen a lot of antioxidant research and I haven't really seen any research suggesting yet, and maybe this will be proven wrong, that just giving overweight people antioxidants is going to change their insulin response or their blood glucose response. And I know I'm maybe oversimplifying, but at the same time, I do agree with your glutathione argument. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, well, part of the problem is that uh, most of the antioxidant supplementation trials are based on the old paradigm of if you just increase the amount of antioxidants relative to the amount of oxidants, then you solve oxidative stress. But I think what this indicates is that it's way more complicated than that. Yeah. Thank you. Panel time? Yeah. Or uh, do you want to take one more question? We, see okay. we can do one more question. Uh, is Dr. Panel. Rosedale, uh, Dr. Shanahan, are they here? I'm on the panel, but I want to ask you a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> So uh, in the beginning, I wasn't totally clear as to whether or not the data you had, was it genetic differences in the amylase, or was it measured differences based on the function of the amylase? Oh, both. So the first slide was the variation in duplications of the gene, and the second slide compared the actual activity in the saliva of humans to other great apes. So they correlated. So I wonder if... Oh, they do correlate very strongly, yeah. So I wonder if this is not one of these um, epigenetic uh, adaptations that somebody asked about in the beginning, you know, how does epigenetics fit into these adaptations in the first, uh, one of the first lectures we had here, that the more that we use enzymes, the more the DNA gets exposed and the more it could potentially get duplicated. And I the, think that's genetic rather than epigenetic, but I think you're right the, that if you have... Um, I, I don't think that mutations would be random with respect to use Not of a gene. Right. I think if you have the DNA opened up, they're more vulnerable than mutations. Right. So this could be a beautiful example of somebody's answering somebody's question in the audience earlier. So thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you very much. Is that the last one? Okay. Thank you, everyone.